Six, you got yeah, it. Mark six. How long have you had that horn? Twenty-five years. My friend of mine called me and said, "This pawn shop, not far from you, has a Mark six for three hundred dollars." My mom and I, we ran to the pawn shop with the money, and we were a little too enthusiastic walking in there. Mm. And when he saw that, he was like, I'm not giving this to you. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not selling it. I'm selling it. That's Jaleel Shaw. He's a saxophonist, composer, band leader with three albums under his own name. He's also a member of Roy Haynes and Nate Smith's bands and professor at the New School and Manhattan School of Music, where we met up to have a chat about saxophone. So we were like, like we really want this horn. We're like, what were you? Between six and eight hundred dollars. I ended up getting it for her. And I ended up, you know, we ran back out to the bank and got more, took more money out of my savings. And I've been wow. playing this, you know, ever since. So that's your horn. That horn was destined for you. Yeah. You know, I like to talk about gear. So I asked him about his horn, of course, and the mouthpiece he's playing on. So this is a New York Meyer. Um, last year I was playing at the Blue Note and during sound check, I got a phone call about my horn was on the strap. And it wasn't. And I just let it go. And boom, it hit the ground. And when it hit the ground, like I just stared at it. I didn't even touch the horn for a minute. <laughs> I didn't even pick it up. I just stared at it like because I saw the mouthpiece was like dug into the carpet. Mm. And I, I just I was just like, please let this be fine. Cause I never, you know, I got this for really cheap too when I was in college. And um I've been playing it for a long time. And I picked, eventually picked the horn up, and this whole thing was off, was broken off. And I panicked. In case you don't know, a New York Meyer is a vintage, handmade mouthpiece from the 1960s. It's considered the quintessential classic jazz alto sax mouthpiece. They are rare and sell for quite a bit of money on eBay these days. I went online to see how much they're going for in the saxophone shops, and I saw 17. You know, fifteen hundred, mm. seventeen hundred, and um, I just found, you know, I, I found uh, someone that's paying my pieces, um, Stefan Kramer, and he uh, he fixed this. It cracked again after that. I, mm. I, I was taking it off, and I, I heard a crack. But honestly, I was just in the studio yesterday, and I was using another, uh, a regular Meyer, and this one. You still prefer this one? I had to go back to this. I'm like, this was just in my bag because I was just like, I just carried it around. And what's the tip opening of this one? This is like a, it's between a six and a seven. Right. I have a couple other New York Myers that I've ordered and I haven't tried them yet, but um, I don't know if it's going to match this because this mm. has been. Oh, open. so you got some more coming. I, I have one with me actually. And um, I just got it in the mail, like right when I was walking out the door. Okay, let yeah. me see if I can turn this heater off. I'm nervous though. I'm so nervous. To try it. Have you looked at it yet? I, I only looked at it. I mean, I literally, when I was walking out the door, the mailman came and knocked on my door and gave, gave me the box. Uh, I love so. that. <laughs> I love when the new stuff goes. Yeah, yeah. I, and I, I was excited, but at the same time, I was like, you know, because I got this on eBay, so I have no idea. Jaleel was kind enough to agree to do a quick playtest comparison between the vintage New York Meyer he's been playing for many years, the one that broke on the floor of the Blue Note, the one he had just received that day from eBay, as well as a standard stock Meyer USA mouthpiece that you can buy in a store new. Have a listen and let us know in the comments below your thoughts and which one you prefer. <laughs> If I do put the time, just like I have the other Meyer, am I going to get be able to get that Meyer to get like this? When you have that sound in your head, like when I have the, the sound that I have in my head, it definitely changes, you know? 
if from time to time I, I, I feel like, okay, I, I want it to be a little bit darker. I want maybe I now I'm ready. There, there was a time where I was like, oh, okay, I want it to be a little bit brighter. Overall, there's something that I'm hearing. And I think that's what really messed me up about this was that this was probably the closest mm. that I've been. This was filmed back in early February. I spoke to Jaleel yesterday and he told me he's now playing on that New York Meyer he bought off of eBay. I thought he sounded best on that one and I guess he does too. I actually got in contact with Babbitt about the Meyers because mm -hmm. I ordered the 100th anniversary. Mm, that's Meyer. actually a good one. I liked it, but it was it was very bright. It's more bright. And I, I said, you know, hey, like I'm a New York Meyer enthusiast. <laughs> I just got this New York Meyer, but what are you basing this off? False advertising, right? Right. I said, what are you basing this off of? Because I have a New York Meyer, and it doesn't play like that. It's a lot warmer and a lot darker. I have like maybe three or four other Meyers that I've had over the I've gotten over the past twenty years, and I said, um. They all play completely different. Is there something about the years that when, when these things are made that you can tell me about? He said, he wrote me back, he said, every Meyer is different. If I'm honest, I feel like, honestly, this is probably the most important part of it now. Where I, 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 whereas, I mean, I still think the saxophone is very important, which you have, but this can change everything. Sure. And you can do a lot to change the sound of your, you know, and I have a couple other altos that, and I realized that if I change the mouthpiece, I can get closer to what I want on this. If I change the mouth, if I get the right mouthpiece on the on a horn that might not be as, as you know as great as this, but if I don't have the right mouthpiece, you know, and you know the ligature and the reed, all that plays plays a big part too. But the how much ligature is, is this you got? This is a bay ligature, but going into the studio. It's like a magnifying glass. Mm. And I think that's the thing. Now, you know, more than ever now, I'm trying to record. I have a Zoom, and I'm trying to record my every performance. I tell my students um, to record their practice routines. Can you imagine waking up every day and not knowing what you were putting on, not knowing what you were wearing, and just going out every day wearing that? And then one day... <laughs> Someone puts a mirror in your place and you walk by the mirror and you see everything, like how you're wearing, like what, what is it, how, you know, how do you trim your beard, you know, with the saxophone or, or with just with music. It's important to listen to yourself and see where you are, you know, where, where, how's my intonation, how's, you know, am I getting the sound that I want, you know, is it as bright as I think it is, is it, is it as dark as I think it is? Because if you're not recording, you know, you're, you might be steering in a direction that's not really where you want to go. Right, and often what we're hearing, or not often, but what we're hearing when we're playing is not the same thing that's coming out exactly. on the other end. Right. And that depends on the room, and that depends on lots of factors, but right. the, the recorder tells a, a, a mature story. It does, you know? it does. Because sometimes going to the studio can be expensive. You can find a good studio that's not too expensive and find some musicians, like-minded musicians, that want to record and you can kind of, you know, make a, an arrangement. If you play on my recording, I'll play on yours, or we'll kind of find some kind of situation where it's not too expensive. Because it's, it's important also to document where you are. Mm -hmm. Recording is just as important, I, I feel, as, as performing. It's, it's a different kind of muscle, I think, that you're, that, that, that you're working on right. when you're in the studio. And like performing, the more recording you do, the better you get at it. And exactly. Of... Charlie Parker and Train and, I mean, a lot of the masters that we listen to, they were recording a lot. Yeah. Our artists might put out two or three records a year or yeah. something like that. Yeah. You know, and now we're recording and sometimes putting out records every two or three years, right. four years. Yeah. You know? So, yeah, we don't get as much practice no. in the studio. <laughs> yeah. I definitely feel comfortable. I like, you know, I love my horn. I love my setup. But one of the, the most important saxophonists in the history of the saxophone at times didn't have a saxophone. Mm. Charlie Parker didn't own a saxophone at times. Yes. He was borrowing people's horns. There aren't too many recordings that I listen to and I think, oh, what horn is this? Was this? It doesn't sound as good as that yeah. other recording and what horn, you know what I mean? Yeah. So that's the thing that brings me back, that, that draws me back 
you know, and puts everything into perspective. He was able to make those adjustments yeah. faster because he was probably he was doing it so. And those often. horns were different too. I yeah. mean, they're not like modern horns right, today right, right. that are like pretty similar. Right, right, right. Back then, the horns were far. You know, you put your fingers on it, like where are the right, keys? Right, right, right. And actually, I did this last year at a. I, I was a guest artist at a at a middle school. I said, "Who are you checking out? Who who are you listening to?" And nothing. And I said, "Well, can you name some saxophonists?" Okay. So, with everything that you do, I think that it's important to check out those that have come before you. I'm not saying I want you to copy these guys verbatim and, you know, um, you know, imitate their style or their sound, but emulate it. You know, find out those qualities, find out how they got how they got those qualities, and try to figure out what you can do to bring that to what you're hearing. You know. And, you know, that comes over as time, but sometimes I look at the forums and the, the little Facebook groups and I'll see people online saying, oh, uh, I don't do long tones. Long tones aren't important. But, yeah, <laughs> long tones are important because it's about embouchure control. It's about intonation. And the best way to hear your sound is <laughs> to play it for a long time. Just play one note you know, and yeah, focus. Yeah, and focus on it. Because you know? how you got to focus when you're playing lots of notes. Right, right. And each note is different on the whole range of the horn. Exactly, exactly. Transcribing. Very, 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 very important. When I was in college, I started transcribing like crazy. You know, And I, there are different opinions on transcribing because some I think some people think that you... It, this goes back to imitation, you know, and even with my students now, I tell them that, again, you know, you, we're trying to get the information. We're trying to think, we're not only thinking about the exact lines they're playing, we're thinking about the harmonies they're using. We're thinking about the, the, the sound, we're thinking about their technique, you know, we're thinking about their phrasing. So, you know, again, when you go back and you hear a master do that, it brings you closer to where you want to, you know, or, or, or where you should be trying to be, you know, as a, as a, uh, as an artist, you know, you have to check out as much as you can. When you're transcribing, you should write down the solo when you finish it. Memorize it. Learn it. Write down that solo. Because nine times out of ten, you're going to forget a lot of that, that you transcribed. Um, but at any point in your life, you can go back and work on that solo, and that's your A2. Some stuff that I transcribed a long time ago, you know, maybe I wasn't ready to understand exactly what was happening. And then looking at it years exactly. later, it's like, oh, now I understand. Because I've heard that same thing in so many other places, and I'm like, oh, now it all makes more sense. Right. And yeah. then you can analyze it. You can analyze it harmonically, you know. Um, you can analyze it as far as, you know, um, rhythm. Where, where, where the phrases are. The thing about etudes is, it's there. It's written. You can't, you know, the, when we improvise, we can breathe when, when we want. We can stop when we want. You, gotta, you have to read what's on the, the, um, on the page. So etudes are good for reading. Etudes are good, you know, for dexterity, for getting your fingers together. Etudes are good for sound, for dynamics. Um, and which etudes uh, are you talking about? Perling, um, Loyon, <laughs> Marcel Mule. Reading a Charlie Parker solo is the same as reading an etude. You, know, you have to play these notes, developing your repertoire. Yeah. That's that's tunes. You, yeah, yeah, tunes. And by and, and now by developing repertoire, it's not just learning standards. I encourage students to work on some music that they hear. Try to learn that. Mm. Try to learn the music from that. Try to trans. Um, scribe the chord changes. If you like interview videos with great saxophone players like this one, be sure to click the thumbs up button right now and make sure you're subscribed to the channel. I've got a playlist with all my other interview videos in it if you like. Thanks for watching and see you soon.